Okay, um, welcome everybody to the political economy workshop of the University of Massachusetts Amherst. My name is Isabella Weber and I'm thrilled to welcome Zöthiren, um, who is a professor of political science at the School of Public Policy and Management at Tsinghua University and has often been called one of the leading intellectuals of the new left in China. Ji Yuan has taught at MIT for nearly a decade and was a distinguished visiting professor at Cornell University Law School. His publications include The Dilemma of the Invisible Hand Paradigm, Wither China and China and Globalization, Washington Consensus, Beijing Consensus or what? His current research focuses on China and the global political economy in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. Um, and COVID-19 is of course a big part of that. Professor Tsui will today address us um, by talking about the implications of the COVID-19 crisis for China's development model and um, by addressing the question of China's economic policy response um, to the COVID-19 crisis. We will have about 45 minutes of presentation followed by about 40 minutes of Q&A. Feel free to use the chat um, in the meantime to communicate with each other and I will make an announcement on how we handle the Q&A once we get there. Thank you so much, Professor Tsuchian, for agreeing to join us. It's an early hour in Beijing, and I just heard that you have a very busy teaching term. So thank you so much for taking out the time and for um, presenting um, the, on, on this extremely important topic to our workshop. Thank you, Jian. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Isabella, for your kind invitation. I'm also very happy to see some of my old friends. Uh, I mean, not in person, but, uh, but uh, I hope someday in person soon, but uh, like David and uh, Carl, Carl, Professor Carl Riskin, uh, and uh, maybe uh, several others I, I haven't, uh, because I cannot see everyone <laughs> my screen. Uh, so today I am very happy uh, to talk about uh, um, this Chinese policy response to the COVID-19. COVID uh, I, I should say in the beginning that I, uh, this is not really a, a finished research, it's just my, some uh, tentative thoughts. So uh, I, I just, uh, um, when Isabella asked me uh, to talk about this topic, I, I think uh, I, I will take this opportunity to share with you some of my tentative thoughts and get your feedback. Um, so uh, I will, uh, but, but also I also should say that uh, the, the title, initial title may be too broad, uh, like uh, what uh, COVID-19 tell us about China, but actually what I'm going to say is more limited. It's more uh, about just about, um, how to understand the policy responses of China and uh, in comparison with other, especially the major Western countries. Um, so it's a much narrow, narrower topic than the title would suggest. Uh, so, so maybe I should, I, I should start to share my screen to, to present the PowerPoint. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, Okay. Uh, I should, should I, um, I see, okay. Uh, okay, so, so basically I think the COVID-19 crisis uh, has led to a fundamental policy reorientation in China. So I will try to understand uh, this the mechanism of this uh, policy exchange. But the first, I, um, I some, somehow I cannot see uh, the full screen myself. I try to, uh, let me, how, to, how should I? Okay. Um, we can see your slides very clearly, but okay. you cannot see it. Uh, okay. Uh, So I think I would like to start with a puzzle. 
in the United States. Uh, according to a few days ago, associated price analysis reveals that in 376 counties with the highest number of new cases per capita, the overwhelming majority, 93% of those counties, <coughs> went for Trump. A read above other less severely hit areas. Why? So that's the puzzle. So one possible answer could be that Trump voters are simply stupid. I mean, they don't understand the relationship such as wearing a mask and having a get caught by COVID-19. But another possible explanation I think can be found in Mark uh, Bless. Do, do I pronounce his last name correctly, Mark Bless? Yes, I think so. Yeah, and uh, who is a professor of political economy at Brown University. In the March this year, he published a very interesting article in the Foreign Affairs titled, The US Economy is Uniquely Vulnerable to the Coronavirus. Why Americans' growth model suggests it has a few good options. And in turn, the place's approach is based on the Lucio Baccaro and the Jonas Putusen, uh, the, I think the professors at the University of Geneva, uh, their analysis of different components of aggregate demand as a driver of growth in uh, different Western countries. Their model is based on a kind of new uh, Kaleski, this Polish economist who independently, basically independently uh, uh, developed modern microeconomics independent of Keynes, but reached many uh, same conclusions, but with more focus on implications for income distribution. The different growth models has different implications for income distribution. And, uh, and this model of growth based on this new Kaleski approach, uh, try to identify the relative strengths of different components of aggregate demand as driver of growth. And their work published in the Politics and the Society 2016. So, uh, the so basic idea is actually quite simple. And basically different growth models constrain different policy response to COVID-19. I mean, I think this is Mark Blaise's draw the implication from the um, Putusen's new Kaleski growth model. And for example, uh, the UK's mainly domestic consumption driven growth model led to UK government basically guarantee 80% of salary, the wages of almost all enterprises. But Germany's mainly export driven growth model led to government guaranteeing company balance sheets and short work week, but not wages because their growth models main driver are different. But interestingly, uh, Mark Bliss emphasizes that the US mainly main growth model, uh, main growth driver actually is wage, but not credit driven or data dependent as many analysts tend to believe. Even though the credit card and the student loans are part of US household budgeting, but why? And that's because the ratio of household debt to household income, and this ratio in the US actually is in the middle of the OECD countries, US 
is not the ratio is not the highest in the US among OECD countries. So Mark, please believe that the reason is the European, the large welfare state allows their citizen to carry the large amount of debt since they effectively insure them against the periods of unemployment. The most in, indebted people in the world are not Americans, but the Danes and the Dutch. And the police argument is based on a, a study by the, some three Norwegian scholars titled Equality as a Driver of Inequality, Universalist Welfare, Generalized Credit Worthiness and the Financialism Housing Market, published this year. So basically the idea is that the successful decommodification of human lives in the universalist European welfare state lead to generalized credit worthiness of citizens, which stimulates asset price inflation and new wealth and risk inequalities. So in other words, the Europeans, especially Scandinavian countries, I mean, they, the citizens can afford because of their more general and beneficial welfare state that uh, they can afford to have a higher debt than the United States. So the main uh, driver of growth in the US is really the, the salary wage of workers and, uh, and without the more general and broader welfare, guarantee, welfare state guarantees, the household debt actually cannot be um, the main um, driver of the growth in the US. So the US growth model really um, depends on people's employment and the salary. And this uh, a report from CNBC I found uh, interesting and can illustrate this point. <clears throat> because the so-called CARES Act, this is uh, Trump's stimulated stimulate act passed by Congress um, in July. Um, so the CARES Act substantively increased the number of weeks those out of work can collect jobless benefit for most states offering 26 weeks to all states providing a total of at least 39 weeks. However, the, um, the 13 weeks extension called the pandemic emergency unemployment compensation and the provision extending 39 weeks of unemployment benefit to gig and contract workers um, and the self-employed called the pandemic unemployment assistance expire at the end of December this year. So in other words, uh, if the second stimulus demand, which has not been passed, um, I mean, cannot be resolved um, by the end of this year, and before we are sure who will be the next president of the United States, the millions of workers could exhaust their unemployment benefit. So um, does uh, lead to a catch 22 situation of US response to COVID-19. So on the one hand, the US growth model cannot sustain long period of lockdown. This according to Mark Bliss, this lack of shock absorber I mean, basically means the European welfare states is integral to the US growth model. And under normal circumstances, it is a feature, not a bug. But when a system such as American one are hit by shocks, they tend to bail out their financial systems to keep credit flowing and let the real economy absorb the blow through unemployment and austerity policies. 
The assumption is that with no shock absorbers in place, price and wage will adjust quickly, capital will be redeployed, and growth will return without the need for state intervention. So this um, really the, is the US growth model is the adjustment through unemployment. So the, the maybe the US government uh, and can extend unemployment benefit for 13 more weeks, but uh, the whole growth model cannot sustain long period of lockdown. But on the other hand, um, restarting the economy as Trump called repeatedly will simply lead to a more severe crisis of COVID-19. So in other words, I think those maybe those countries who suffered greatly from the COVID-19 still support Trump and not simply because they are stupid or less educated, but because they simply cannot afford leaving uh, without work. Given um, the US growth model. And uh, that's starting point I try to set uh, in comparison with China. So uh, I think there's another puzzle is that in, in, now we move to China. So China did not announce a stimulus package to COVID-19. So uh, in the May this year, um, the People's Congress of China, I mean, had a delayed annual session because usually the People's Congress held annual session in March, but uh, due to the COVID-19 crisis, um, the Con People's Congress in China um, delayed it to May. 22nd, I think. Um, but uh, many people uh, expect in the People's Congress annual session, China uh, would announce a similar stimulus package as many Western countries. Because uh, after the COVID-19 crisis started, major Western countries announce um, quite unthinkable in normal times, uh, this very broad stimulus package, which led to William Buter, the former chief economist of Citigroup, called these radical stimulus measures as pandemic socialism. Well, maybe this pandemic socialism is an exaggeration, but uh, the rescue measure measures initiated by a major Western government in response to COVID-19 are indeed quite unthinkable in normal times. For example, France, the rescue package amounts to 110 billion euros so far. And the budget deficit forecast of this year hit 9% of GDP. Uh, well above the limit usually allowed by European golden rule that require public deficit to remain below 3% of GDP. Actually, since 2016, EU has amended this rule. Actually, the current, so, 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 this so-called golden rule is 1.5%. But major European countries in response to COVID-19 totally ignored their own Golden rule. And for example, the usually the most uh, austerity uh, policy oriented country, Germany, um, announced the rescue package amounts to 10% of annual GDP, far beyond the EU's uh, golden rule. And some bailout funds can be used to recapitalize troubled private enterprises. So this amounts kind of temporary nationalization of German companies. Um, 
So in the United Kingdom, states offer to pay up to 80% of employee wage in order to prevent companies from laying off their workers. Uh, the US are providing 1,200 to everyone earning less than uh, 75,000 a year. Um, and this CARES Act passed on March is a $2 trillion rescue and an investment plan. And the second rescue plan, according to some newspapers I read, uh, that if, uh, if the Democrats can win the two senator seats in Georgia, uh, maybe finally a uh, 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 Biden presidency will finally pass this second rescue plan. But uh, the puzzle is that even though China, in response to the 2008 global financial crisis, has initiated maybe the first global, uh, I mean, uh, major stimulus plan in 2008, is the first among major countries in the world. But this time has not, at least so far, has not uh, announced a similar stimulus plan. I mean, similar in a sense to the 2008 in China or similar to the major Western countries. So the question is why? So some people tend to believe that, uh, argue that, is the reason is very simple. Just be, be, this because China has successfully contained the, co the spread of COVID-19 virus. So therefore, China has no need for stimulus plan package as the Western countries. And the public health policy is really the best economic growth policy during the time of pandemic. I think this is true. Uh, in hindsight, hindsight, but at the time when the People's Congress has to deliberate uh, on whether to have a big stimulus package similar to the 2008 or similar to the current Western stimulus plans, um, it, was still, it was still very uncertain China would successfully contain the spread of virus. So in, in the time of April and May was a highly uncertain period for decision makers in China. Uh, so uh, I think at that time, the main constraints is still similar to Mark Bliss's uh, analysis of constraint of US growth model on the US response to COVID-19. Like China's response in April and May was also constrained by the Chinese growth model, uh, especially this growth model after 2008. <clears throat> uh, so in order to fully answer why China didn't announce a similar stimulus plan. Uh, we need to understand the two success and one failure of the Chinese 2008 physical stimulus program. The first big success of 2008 in China was the construction of a high-speed railway network um, between 2008 and 2014, which reduced the journey from Beijing to Shanghai to 4.5 hours. So this high-speed railway construction was really started in 2008 as a part of this stimu physical stimulus in response to global financial crisis and the decline of Chinese export market. Uh, so by importing the most advanced technology from Germany and Japan and then combining them with local innovations, China has developed one of the most efficient rail network in the world. This one big success in, the, in some infrastructure 
construction. The second big success was the huge public health investment. Um, 2,000 county in China, uh, county hospital, like basically in Chinese countryside, and 5,000 township clinic centers were built with the physical stimulus money. And the health insurance coverage was extended to 30% to 90% of Chinese population, mainly for the rural people. This means a huge progress in covering the rural people. So uh, this is two major success of China's 2008 physical stimulus program. However, there was one um, failure or at least shortback. So in a rush to match the central government's physical stimulus program, many banks and local governments imprudently invested in too many bad projects. As a result, the Chinese economy has built up excessive productive capacities and the enormous domestic private debt. This notion of domestic private debt in China is a little bit uh, tricky, but uh, like the major international organizations like World Bank, IMF, uh, use this term basically in order to compare with other countries. So this domestic private debt means the private or state-owned company's debt and also uh, um, um, in some case, um, I mean, the, so, so, so this, because the state owned the company's debt is also included in this notion of domestic private debt for purpose of comparison with other countries. So that's worth keeping in mind. So between 2008 and 2016, the domestic private debt to GDP ratio has roughly increased 100 percentage points from 140% to 240% of GDP. But some, according to some other estimates, actually this ratio is as high as 3%, 300% uh, of GDP. This may explain why the central government is reluctant to have another 2008 style physical stimulus now. It may worsen the bad debt problem and possibly lead to a domestic financial crisis. And actually in the 2017, in the Politburo meeting, China first proposed the concept called Hongguan Ganga Lü, namely the micro, micro leverage ratio. Um, try to contain the rise, high rise of the, the so-called domestic private debt. But uh, this does not mean uh, Chinese government in April, I mean, since February actually has done nothing. And actually uh, the legal and the regulation remedies to the recession caused by COVID-19, uh, I mean, has been, uh, I think it was Chinese government's response. Uh, for example, in Fe since February, the relevant ministries of the Chinese central government have announced temporary policies such as exempting VAT, the value added tax for small business, Ex exempting or halving social insurance contributions by employees and encouraging local governments to waive urban land use tax in order to reduce rent facing companies. The central government also require utility companies 
to lower the price of electricity in order to cut the cost of resuming production. On March uh, 13, the Chinese Central Bank also cut reserve ratio by 1%, thereby releasing 550 billion yuan amounts to 80 billion US dollars of a long-term fund. And uh, in April, actually, uh, Chinese government further propose and implement, implement the so-called six protections policy. Um, uh, on April 17, the Politburo of the Chinese Communist Party held a meeting in which a new policy of six protection has been announced. In fighting against the adverse economic consequences of COVID-19, the Politburo said, the first priority is to protect people's employment. So the five other protections are protecting people's basic livelihood, protecting market entities, meaning avoiding too much bankruptcy, and protecting food and energy securities, and protecting the supply chain of industries, and protecting the functioning of local society. The same day, April 17th, the Chinese State Statistical Bureau published the data of the 2021st quarter GDP growth rate, which is the negative 6.8%. This is the first time the growth rate turns negative in China since 1976. It, was, it is no coincidence that the announcement of the new six protections policy and the announcement of the National Bureau of Statistics data took place on the same day. <clears throat> so, uh, so I mentioned earlier that the uh, United States has, had, has no similar shock observers like a European welfare state. Um, but China, of course, has no similar European style social welfare state. But the Chinese countryside uh, with the peasants uh, still owns, or at least uh, lease on a more or less permanent basis of their arable land. Um, seems to serve as a kind of shock of a sober. So on April 20, the State Studies Bureau published another set of data. Uh, the important thing to notice is that urban employment declined by 6% in China in the first quarter, 2020. In 2019, the Chinese urban employment population was 440 billion. So the 6% decline means 26.4 million people exited from labor market due to COVID-19. So that's the April data. So quite a large number of people. They are mostly rural migrant workers who returned to the countryside since they could not work in the cities during the pandemic. Technically, they are not counted as unemployed, but obviously they should be a main concern for achieving the first protection, namely the protection on employment of this six protection policy announced by Politburo in April 17. In the same meeting on April 17, the Politburo also decided to issue a special public debt for fighting COVID-19. This led to some interesting debate among Chinese economists on whether the rule 
that the budget deficit should not exceed 3% of GDP. Uh, this EU golden rule should be abandoned this year in China, but because this is maybe puzzling, uh, uh, because China obviously is not a member of EU, but why China adhere voluntarily to the 3% budget rule is because in the year 1998, uh, this during the aftermath, immediate aftermath of Asian financial crisis, um, China kind of implicitly adopted uh, this EU 3% golden rule. But I have argued at that time, but also this year publicly that uh, actually this is based on the misunderstanding uh, of EU golden rule. Because first of all, we can, as many Western economists have challenged this 3% golden rule for the EU for lack of real sound economic reasons. But I argue that in China, even if we want to adopt 3% um, rules, um, we should understand why, what was the reason for European Union to choose 3%. Actually, uh, the 3% was chosen as the historical, every historical average of fixed asset investment of European Union member countries on average. So, so if China really want to adhere to the 3% golden rule of European Union, uh, China should understand this rationale behind the 3% and using the historical average of fixed as an investment, which in the case of China, uh, at least uh, in the, when I calculate in the, in the 1998, it was not 3%, but 4.5% of GDP should be the golden rule for China. But anyway, this is all the debate come up again during, uh, among Chinese scholars um, publicly in the right before the May 22nd People's Congress annual session this year. Uh, so I, I think, uh, so even so, so my basic point is that uh, even though there was no similar physical stimulus this time, similar in the sense, nature to the China's 2008 physical stimulus, or in the sense, similar to the this year's Western countries stimulus plan. Um, but China's response uh, mainly consists in uh, legal and regulation, regulation measures and uh, six protection policies and uh, rural migrant workers with their still holding their land in the countryside as a shock absorber. But finally, uh, I'd like to say um, this COVID-19 may be uh, leading to a major policy reorientation, namely the so-called dual circulation strategy. So the President Xi Jinping announced first time in July 21. So the July 21 was the occasion, occasion was uh, Xi Jinping's meeting with the representatives of Chinese private entrepreneurs. So in this meeting, he first proposed dual circulation and two days ago in July 23rd, the Politburo meeting formally announced dual circulation strategy. What, what does it mean? So because in the 1980s, um, China has this so-called uh, international 
economic circulation, a great, great international economic circulation, that's in the 1980s. And uh, Chinese uh, entering, uh, I mean, uh, since Deng Xiaoping's southern tour in the 1992, 1991, and especially after China's accession to WTO, this export-oriented uh, development strategy uh, really uh, took the shape. And uh, so, so this is a very uh, big number. In the 2006, China's foreign trade dependency ratio is as high as 62.4. Percent. So this trade, foreign trade dependent ratio is the uh, import and plus export divided by GDP. Um, but since um, 2008, global financial crisis and the China's effort to rebalance the economy toward more domestic demand and a domestic assumption driven economy. So last year, 2019, the China's foreign trade dependency ratio has been reduced by half to three, uh, 31.8%. And, uh, uh, but it is still quite high. Uh, in the larger economy, large countries in the world, for example, United States, the so dependent ratio is much lower. And, uh, and the China's consumption as a proportion of GDP. So before the, uh, I mean, the early period of in the 1983 is 67.3% of GDP. But in 2010, this consumption as a proportion of GDP has been reduced to 49.3%. So last year, the consumption as a, pro as a proportion of GDP is 55.4%. It's quite low in comparison with the major countries in the world, not to more advanced West countries, but even in comparison with large developing countries. Because in the United States, Europe, this percentage is all more than 70 or 80%. And uh, uh, um, so five yes. more minutes. Yes, so, uh, so I think that, because it's interesting that uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping's new strategy of dual circulation basically mean the this dual circulation means domestic circulation plus international circulation, but with domestic domestic circulation as a main focus. So in but then the Chinese scholars know uh, economists. Uh, in recent days, in the last few weeks, uh, because uh, this, since uh, first time uh, President Xi Jinping announced the dual circulation, uh, uh, really the three months, uh, three weeks ago, uh, to China uh, announced uh, so-called Chinese Communist Party Central Committee's suggestion to the People's Congress on uh, on the formulation of 14th five-year plan in which uh, the dual circulation strategy has been formally written into the CCP's suggestion for 14th five-year plan. So there's a lot of Chinese academic debate uh, what the dual circulation really means uh, but some people think that this domestic circulation means uh, 
under the pressure of like a trade wars with the United States, China uh, has to become more inward oriented. But um, I think more people uh, emphasize that uh, both domestic and the foreign circulation are, are needed. Uh, and uh, but the with the domestic circulation as a main focus means that China has to do difficult task of institutional and the policy reforms, which can raise the Chinese people's consumption, con consumption capabilities. They could be mean the institutional arrangements which make Chinese workers sell wage can rise in capital with the increase of labor productivity. This may require more labor unions strength and power. Or uh, it also can, should mean that faster pace of integration of rural and urban development, such as a quicker abolishment of the code system, because uh, due to this so-called household registration system, many migrant workers cannot uh, have their children uh, get educated in the urban areas. I mean, usually during the holiday, they have to go back to their countryside. And uh, like the female migrant workers usually have to go back to their countryside home to give birth. All this actually reduce Chinese domestic consumption capabilities. And uh, so this dual circulation strategy, especially with the main focus on domestic circulation should mean uh, major institutional reform, strengthening Chinese workers' power and uh, Chinese um, peasants, more fuller integration in the urban development. So let's see uh, whether or not this dual circulation strategy will be uh, materialized. Uh, if so, I think uh, the COVID-19, I mean, has, I mean, as a crisis becomes an opportunity as a Chinese old saying has it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Tsui Tuyen. I think this was a great sweeping presentation of both the European US and in particular the Chinese uh, response to um, COVID-19 and not only the specific economic policy response, but also what this tells us about the growth model more generally.